nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Oh, I just had one of those moments where I looked at the screen behind me and like almost got lost in the pledge. <laughs> Yikes. Um, roll call, no. Mrs. Mayor. Absolutely. Gary Dunlap. Here. Tom Cruise. Excused. Jeff Young. Um, he is excused. I haven't heard from him. Okay. Cheryl Hancock. Here. Anita Shagazinski. Here. Kate Mayor, I'm here. Lisa Collins. Here. And Tim Medgar. Excused. Thank you. And so with five of the seven school board members present, I would declare a quorum. Approval of the agenda. I would note that the agenda has been posted, distributed, and sent to the local media. With this in mind, are there any changes to the agenda? Otherwise, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda as published. I would so move. Is there a second? I'll second. Uh, who beat? Second. Period. <laughs> I'll let you guys fight it out. Our um, secretary calls Lisa. Sorry. Motion has been made and seconded to approve the agenda as published. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, aye. nay. Motion carries. Um, public participation. Is there anyone who <coughs> wishes to address the board relative to any item at this time? We ask that a five minute time limit per person be followed. Please come forward, state your name, address, and topic to be addressed. Okay, I don't see anyone coming forward, so we'll move on to recognition and thank you. Dr. Mueller? Yeah, tonight we'd like to thank uh, Sergeant Laboratories for their recent donation of $2,000 towards the robotics club at the high school. Um, this will help pay for their registration um, for their robotics competition. So we thank them for their um, kind donation. Great. The robotics club is a new club, and, right? Yes. And so it's nice to see that they're getting some support for that. That's great. Um, district administrator's report, Dr. Miller. OK. Um, we had this past couple of weeks, um, the eighth grade students at the middle school received their Chromebooks. And um, if you saw on their Facebook page, they had the video and it was quite a bit of excitement there with that. And then our seventh graders will be getting theirs on December 7th. So the excitement continues and so on um, with that unveiling of the Chromebooks for the students. Um, we did have a sad event happen. Um, our, con our deepest condolences go out to uh, Jacob Schrader and his family. Um, we lost Jacob uh, on Friday evening, but uh, we will be by their side. Um, they have services tomorrow from 9 to 11 and a funeral at 11, so we will be there and supporting the family. Uh, let's see. We also we are working on hard the unveiling of our district Facebook page and our building Facebook pages. Um, our, the principals have been working very hard. They've, they've had to forge over many IDs and information to say that they are the official page and they are having a hard time believing some of them. So um, <laughs> in the Vision newsletter, newsletter coming out, come in that for December 1st, we're hoping that most of the pages are up and running and we'll have some information in there on people and how to um, get connected with that with actual training for any community members so that they can get hooked up um, with the Facebook pages in the district and so forth. Um, we had many Veterans Day events going on throughout the district um, in honoring them um, at all of our buildings um, and so forth. And then also just kind of a follow-up, you know, we had our board retreat and with Crown Global and really worked on our um, our operating principles and so on. So what I did is I just I shared with you um, kind of my transition plan and where things are at, so you can have an idea of um, what things I've been working on and working with um, within the district to kind of keep on track and moving us in the right direction. Um, just wanted to share that with you, and that would be the district administrator report okay. for this evening. Thank you very Thanks. much. Then moving on to reports and discussion, the LMC report. I will ask the library directors to come forward, LMC directors. I'm assuming you would like me to use a microphone because I'm going to be out in among the crowd. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, with her new Chromebook. See, she got her white Chromebook. Old power to turn on. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just when you thought it might work. 
Yeah, we'll get it. Testing, yeah. testing. Yeah. Okay, okay, there you go. I say the um, library media specialists will figure it out. <laughs> yes. So um, Stacy and Becky are here with me. Um, my name is Lisa Risch. I'm the library media director at the middle school. Stacy Eskelson is the library media director at Evergreen, and Becky Harris is with us from Viking. Uh, we are without Aaron Foster right now, who's on maternity leave, and the, our other two library media directors had child commitments tonight. So our report today is an interactive report because we thought with um, our new technology in the district, it would be good for you to actually experience what that would look like. So Stacy has up the site that I would love for you to go to if you would like to participate in our interactive report. It's nearpod.com. We've used this with um, students in the middle school several times, and one of the pluses is why I am up and about, because if someone needs help, I can actually help them from my Chromebook, because I can do everything right from my lap instead of being behind my desk. In the very top right-hand corner, you'll see a rectangle that says Join Session. And Stacy's going to type in the code for you. It's Z-Y-W-A-D. And she'll leave that up for a little bit in case you need to see that again. Mr. Dunlap, I do have a Chromebook if you would like to have one. OK. <laughs> OK. Can you repeat would you like that? one? Z, Kate? Y. Z, Y, W, A, D. You got to be capped? Yeah, it came across as capitals. I have to do this. I don't want to sign. Welcome to the session. Oh, excellent. I'll just log in. I don't want to sign up. Use that code to get into the session. Oh, excuse me. Okay. I might have mistyped that address. Yeah. So when you get in, um, you have an opportunity to, to put in your first name. If you would like to use a pseudonym, that is fine with me, as long as it's school appropriate. <laughs> I did this with our staff at a in service on November sixth, and we had some very creative names. When I do it with students, of course, I require them to use their first name and also a class session. And a, a nice part about this program is that I can see results on my device. So as students are answering questions, as you will be as well, um, I can see what they're answering. So if you could just look at me when you're logged in and ready to go and you've entered your name, Please I'll know you're ready. You can hit send. And I also can tell you're ready because I can tell who's signed up here. So we have a few great pseudonyms. Our future governor is with us tonight. <laughs> <laughs> that excites me. Yes. <laughs> Good night for autographs then. Yes, I yes. agree. Mm -hmm. So thank you for having us tonight for the um, annual School District of Home and Library Media Report. We are happy to talk to you about our program. We think of this as kind of an advocacy piece, and we like to brag a little bit. So please bear with us while we do that. What we're going to be doing today is looking closely at our library media program and how we do things um, beyond just checking out books. And you'll notice that we're trying to focus a little bit on our vision and mission tonight. Or something funny. Check it faster. So our mission is to commitment to learning. We are very committed to learning in our schools, and one of the things that you need to think about is the fact that um, it's hard for us to list everything we actually do for teachers and students in our schools to keep learning active. We are very, very busy. Um, it's not a quiet place like your past library might have been in your own schools. We are a hub of learning. Your turn. How many classes would you guess that a librarian has in her library on a typical day? When you make your choice, you can hit send. You should get a little thank you note. I can see who's responded so far. Our future governor was right up there in a quick answer. This is considered a poll. So what I'm going to do is share the results with you which will eliminate the ability for anybody else to answer. 
but I'm happy to see that most of you realize how busy we are. It is true that on a typical day, we can see between eight and 10 library classes in one day. Um, if you multiplied that by 25 to 30, you see how many students we're interacting with on a regular basis. A little quiz for you. What does ISTE stands for? I-S-T-E. This is another part of the interactive piece where you can actually ask students to give you a short answer. I'll wait just a little bit while you make your guesses. Thanks for not giving away the answer, Stacy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you about 10 more seconds, and then we'll move along. Some people may not know that answer. <laughs> if I were in a real classroom, I would be spying on you. But in order for your privacy, I'm trying to not walk behind you. But it's, it's definitely out of my nature to not walk around and look at people's screens. So. Okay, I'm seeing some answers come through. The answer is it's the International Society of Technology Education. Yes, very close. I mention that because <laughs> as part of our job, we <coughs> encourage um, readers, but we also use those ISTE standards. They're technology standards that are embedded within our Common Core curriculum. And part of our goal of encouraging readers includes what you see on the screen, but also encouraging readers to try new things involving technology. This gives you a historical look at circulation. Last year at our um, report, I believe it was a board member who said, it would be nice to see a more historical look at this. So um, as you're looking at numbers there, you're actually looking at number of items over the course of the nine month school year in circulation. And Erin Foster would be mortified to see her numbers this year have gone down. But I have to caution you to understand that high school students really are still reading. Um, many, many high school students are choosing to buy books on their own. Um, many of them are using our databases for their research instead of nonfiction reading, which um, dominates many of our elementary and middle school selections. And so the trend may look like it's moving down for high school, but each group is also different as well. At any point in time, if you have any questions, please let me know. And also, if you're interested in joining our book club, um, many of the high school and middle school selections are very appropriate for adults, and we would love to have you join with us. Uh, you wouldn't even have to come to a meeting, but I could just say, hey, the school board president is reading the same book we are. And that would be very cool. <laughs> We believe modeling is very important. So another interactive question for you is, how many books have you read in the last month? This is another thing that I could share with students so they could also realize that there are many, many of us. So this is gonna have to be, I read by myself. Right, <laughs> right. Between my granddaughter and I, we read a book a day almost. So. You'd be in the hundreds then. <laughs> so they have to have more than five, five pages. Five pages, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Age appropriate? Yeah. <laughs> Gives you an idea that many of us are readers. A large part of our job is also focusing on digital resources. So as Dr. Mueller mentioned, our one-to-one -one initiative has really taken up a lot of the energy at the middle school and the high schools in preparation for next year. That doesn't mean that our elementary schools are not using technology. Um, for instance, we have a database called Safari Montage that we use to enhance our video curriculum. And uh, we're averaging, that was the record count for the 2014-15 school year in number of video clips. So it is an expensive resource that we use, but if you looked at the number of video clips that were shown, and imagined us ha needing to pay between 15 and $20 maybe for each DVD. Um, you can see how it's a very cost-effective choice. It's also nice because Safari Montage does clips instead of full-length, well, there are full-length videos, but many, many teachers use the clips so that they can just show a short 
amount of the video that really enhances what they're trying to teach in their curriculum. Elementary is especially focusing on ebook um, demonstrations, and Becky does that often in her library, showing students what they can use online for ebooks. Um, in the middle school, what I've noticed is that ebooks and um, audiobooks as well, students tend to use them kind of as a last resort if the book that they want isn't quite there. Our students still tend to want to have a book in their hand. Um, I thought it would be interesting for you to know about the Common School Funds, which fund that safari montage purpose. Um, this is a fund that's provided for us by the state of Wisconsin going back to 1848. And we receive a lot of money for this that we use for very scripted purchases. Uh, we can now use them for technology purchases, software purchases, and book purchases, as well as the cataloging for our materials. But for instance, if we needed a new television, or if we needed um, book supplies, like tape and things like that, those um, purchases are not followed underneath this rule. So this shows you the ability to use the drawing feature. Using the drawing feature, there's a little menu at the bottom. If you click on the pencil, would you write in your estimation about how much money the Holman Library has received as part of that common school fund in 2015? What I'll see on my screen is your beautiful drawings. This was a little more fun when I did it with sixth graders and told them that they could draw whatever they wanted. <laughs> I believe you can also click on the typing tool and type in your response as well. I have one answer coming in. Yeah, kids really like this part. Oh, it's more fun when you can draw it, though. I'll give just a few minutes for people to submit their drawings, and then we'll move on. A few more seconds. <laughs> Everybody chose the black ink. Oh. <laughs> Could change the colors. <laughs> Do it over. Okay, I'm going to count five, four, three, two, and one. And the answer is the number of dollars that we receive from the state for a common school fund is $155,010.80. So that is distributed on a per pupil basis to each one of our buildings. And library media directors do decide where those funds go, and we do. Mine is primarily used for database purchases, um, online resources, books, of course. And um, in the past, it's had to be used to purchase computers. Um, with the purchase of the one to one initiative, that funding is now going into programs like Nearpod, so we can do fun things with um, resources. Um, as you can see in the picture, also book fairs help fund other purchases that we make in our buildings that aren't covered by that fund as well. We focus on communication, staff development, program development. We often are asked to be presenters at our professional development days. Um, several of us have been presenters at our Wisconsin um, Library Media Technology Association um, conference, which is in the spring in Madison. Um, we also work on communicating with parents. We have social media pages as well, m many of us do. And so one more little interactive is to fill in the blanks. Using the words from below, you can just drag your answers in to fill in those sentences. And again, I'm seeing the answers on my screen, so from a formative assessment piece. I can see how students are participating, who's getting these answers right. I also get this sent back to me in a report form, so I can see how students are answering as well. Great job, Stacy. In 2014-15, our staff had a goal to um, prepare digital age learners to be efficient and ethical users of information and technology. And one of the ways that we decided to do that was to communicate and think of our learners as our teachers, as well as our students. So every month, we provided a resource to teachers regarding copyright and um, fair use 
guidelines. Um, the picture that you see on that slide is an example of one of the things that we shared. We are often asked questions about, may I copy all of the pages in this book? Um, is it okay if I send this video in, online? And we are the first go-to people for that. It's not always the favorite part of our job <laughs> because it's a difficult um, legal responsibility as well. The nine aspects of digital responsibility are listed, uh, which cover some things that aren't maybe necessarily tied exactly to the library, but I think they are to the school board. For instance, digital access is something that I know our board has focused on a lot, making sure that we have equal access for all students and learners. And digital law, of course, follows that other guideline. So if you were asked this question, how would you answer? <clears throat> so the correct answer on this is that this would be considered um, an illegal use of copyright material. We're not allowed to just make audio recordings, even though it would be helpful for many of our students if we did so. Um, that would not be a legal use of um, the, the resources. Uh, we actually have, a, I had, was just asked this question today, I'm going to be contacting the author um, because an audio book was never made, and so I'm going to be contacting the author to get permission um, to have a teacher read and record a book so that a, a student can read it. So there are ways to, to legally do this, but as it is, it's not a legal question to do. Could you, can I ask you a question? Yes. Could you do just one chapter? Is it the amount of chapters or you couldn't do any? You couldn't do any. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Why? Um, they view it as many of the books are made in audio form anyway. And so you would need to purchase the audio form. It's looked at as um, you are preventing the purchase of the audio book, and therefore you're taking away from the potential benefit of the author or the publisher financially. So looking to the future, of course, with the one-to-one -one Chromebook rollout at home in middle school and home in high school, we are very excited about it. I can concur that eighth graders were tickled pink. Um, students who have um, appear to have everything at their disposal. They have the coolest clothes. They, they do the coolest things. We're still walking around with that Chromebook like it was a precious gift from, from the elders. Um, <laughs> and they are taking very good care of it as well. Seventh and sixth graders are looking forward to December 7th. Elementary schools are looking forward to some tech technology upgrades. Our high school will be getting the middle school Chromebooks to use as they're prepar preparing for next year. And we do want you to know that books are still a very, very big part of our life. Like I said, students are still choosing to read books instead of reading things online. Google Apps for Education continues to be a big focus for all of us, as does online research. And we expect that this will continue and grow as students become more and more adept at using Chromebooks. One of the things that we talk about in the middle school, for instance, is how we learn from each other. Many times a student will learn something in Google Apps for Education that I didn't know, and I think it's really cool when they share it with me. Uh, and so we're kind of looking at it as all learning together. And as our elementary librarians are preparing students, we can definitely see a difference um, coming into the middle school. They're just more prepared. The, the longer we use it, I think the more learning we'll be able to do. We welcome any ideas for future reporting. If there's something that you think of and think, oh, I'd like to know a little bit more about that. We would love to know a little bit more about that. And we um, thank you for your continued support in our libraries. Any questions at all? Any questions? Thank you for playing with me today. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I very much appreciate it. I like to do the hands-on so, things. So. so can I just ask you, who, mm -hmm. what are some of the names that you had for, I'm just curious to know, <laughs> besides future governor? A lot of people were just naming their own, their own names. But oh, let me go back and take a look. to see what you see. <laughs> you don't have to, Lisa. I was just curious. <laughs> <laughs> You really, you don't have to. I thought they would just pop right up and you rattle them off. No, most people use their real names besides the future governor. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> uh, 
<coughs> you know, I think in the future too, as the one to one is implemented, to know um, how is it done, implemented in the classroom. You know, the if I'm sure it's going to start slow and then it will be implemented in you know 30 percent of the classrooms and then 60 percent of the classrooms and then 100 percent but as that transition goes that would be good to hear about because it's not going to happen all at once we know that so i think that programs like this make teachers excited and they want to use it as well so the funding to be able to do that now that we don't have to purchase devices really makes a difference you no know, there are small things when we went to school board um, meeting years and years ago I just remember we did something with technology where we all voted and then you had instant response those kind of things and I just think about this instant response where you can see and you can put it up there for the students to see where were their answers in line without embarrassing them right and, the, and so it's okay to have a wrong answer and then going back and helping them find the right answer and there's just so many applications beyond just the school board report so agreed mm -hmm. yeah it was a little difficult to adapt for a school board report it was easier to do for the math teacher yeah <laughs> so okay well thank you very thank much thank you i have to get back into dropbox someday google's doc google docs maybe will be the application we use for our board meetings oh <laughs> and we get trained i like that we gotta get trained i think my brain could do that for you. That maybe we could set up a train <laughs> for that. We've been kind of talking a little bit about that lately. Good. Good. Yeah. So then the next report is the 2016-17 budget input variables. Best estimates, Julie. <laughs> Good evening. Tonight I'm going to present to you the budget input variables for the development of the 2016-17 budget. The school district of Holman contracts with PMA, uh, Representative Scott Gralla, to assist the district with five-year financial forecasting. Um, and we just wanted to let the board know that they are in, um, they are transitioning to a new model called FiveCast. And rather than recreating that format um, to present budget variables to you, we anticipate adopting PMA's format. Um, it'll be more consistent and efficient. But until they are um, fully on board with their new model, I have presented it in the um, Dropbox in a spreadsheet format that you see in front of you. We'll begin with the projected um, percent salary increases, the first line item. The calculation of base cost for salary negotiations is based on the July 1st consumer price index urban rate. Um, the actual percent will be available in January, so we will use for fiscal year 17 negotiations, we will use the July 1st, 2016 consumer price index. Um, the rate that we're putting in the projection model for the first year of the forecast is a quarter of a percent. The reason for this um, rate is because the Rate has declined since last July 1st. If you recall, when we negotiated with um, the various employee groups last year, we were using a 1.62% CPI. Since then, it has dropped to 0.31%. And so we anticipate it may continue to decline, and the July 1st, 2016 rate will be pretty low. Um, the budget input variable recommended for fiscal year 17 is a quarter percent with a half a percent increase um, in the four years following. The next line item is the um, FICA, which is Social Security and Medicare. This rate has been at 7.65% for many years, and we are estimating that it'll stay at that rate um, through the model. The Wisconsin retirement rate goes from 6.8% to 6.6% in January of 2016, and so we have carried that 6.6% through all five years of the model. We do not project an increase in um, either the life insurance or the income protection, um, which is LTD limit um, insurance. We've kept that at 0%. For fiscal year 17, our prediction on health insurance is a 0%. The reason for this is the proposed change to health insurance plan design, which would include an HSA 
and so we anticipate any reduction in premium will be offset by an increase in HSA employer contributions. Following the fiscal year 17, zero percent in health insurance, we um, anticipate a five percent uh, year-over-year increase in premiums. And dental insurance, we've entered two percent across the board. Next, I'll talk about the staffing level additions or attrition. For both retirements and replacements, we have um, entered 12 for all five years. This means that um, we would um, post all positions for those that have retired. Um, enrollment projections I will show you at the end of this um, presentation, but with increasing enrollment, we don't anticipate that we would be decreasing in staff. The last line item there under staffing level, the teaching staff FTE percent change. The percent across the um, five years, starting at 0.13%, ending at 0.74%, is the direct percentage increase of our enrollment projections over the next five years. And so we would um, change the staffing in correlation with the increase in seat enrollment. The next area is the non-salary, um, non-benefit expenditure input variables. The first line item being the capital objects reduction to buildings and grounds. Um, below we have an increase in potential utilities in electricity and so the first capital objects reduction is just to offset that increase in utility expenses. The next line is the capital objects fleet replacement. In um, last April, the community approved the referendum for fleet and facilities, and that begins next year. So there is an increase in expenditures for the fleet replacement of 160,000, and an increase in expenditures for facilities maintenance of 175,000. The next line is the technology referendum. Now that went in place in fiscal year 16, or currently, and it is for four years. So this model shows that it'll be dropping off the expenditures, and you'll see it also on the revenue side. Um, so a reduction in expenditures and technology capital in fiscal year 20 of 655,000. This area shows a projection or input variable for um, utilities, and we are projecting or using a half a percent year over year for electricity. Um, both for heat and other than heat. The bottom of page one is the estimates being used in the input variables for budgeting for district insurances, 2% for both district liability and property insurance, and then for workers' compensation, since it's a rate that's um, calculated on wages, um, I've input the same percent increase in wages according to what we first talked about with the CPI um, index um, beginning next July 1st, and that has been transferred down here to the increase in work comp since the direct relation on that premium. Page two is the beginning of the revenue input variables. Uh, locally, we've experienced um, nice growth in equalized property value compared to state averages, we've been above and we've reported that the last two months with our um, budget hearing and annual meeting and then the certification of our most recent levy. Um, because of our uh, growth, we, have we are using a 4.5% increase on the local equalized property valuation in each year of the model. Again, because we're adding the 335,000, which is the total of the fleet and facility maintenance expenditures um, based on the referendum, we are also including the new revenue in fiscal year 17 of the 335,000 based on the referendum. The next line is a reduction in the revenue limit, and that is corresponding with the reduction in the expenditures for the technology referendum in fiscal year 20. 
According to last May's legislative decision, the per pupil categorical aid goes from $150 to $250 for fiscal year 17. So we've increased the per pupil categorical by $100 for next fiscal year. After that, we really don't know what they're going to do at the state level, and so um, there's a conservative zero percent, zero dollar increase on the per pupil categorical um, fiscal years 18 through 21. We rely on Scott's expertise at PMA to assist us in the input variables for the um, cost ceilings and the aid guarantees in the next section. The revenue input variable for investment income, um, beginning with 2% and then slowly declining over the next four years. The open enrollment tuition amount has a small increase over the next five years. And then um, trend tells us that the special education aidable costs will continue to decline. And so there's a small decrease year after year, year over year in the aidable costs for special education. The result in that is a larger um, general fund interfund transfer to the special education fund. Page three is the enrollment projections. And this is an update to the information um, presented prior to the third Friday September counts. And so this includes um, traditional method of projection, but it's based on third Friday, September 2015 um, updated data. And I want just to point out, just above the open enrollment outline is the change percentage. Um, you'll notice that the beginning with 0.13%, so I'm right towards the bottom of the page here, um, Going across that correlates with the staff increase, a teacher FTE increase that we talked about on the first page of expenditures. And you'll notice also that in fiscal years 17 um, and 20, it's a much smaller increase compared to maybe the previous years or the other two, three years on the model. That's because we are graduating much larger classes than we are anticipating coming in. And so the growth is not as great. Are there any questions by the board? Eight. I have a question. Um, the first line to me is just like so, so depressing when you look at what salary, and I know this is just a best estimate, I really do, and that it can change. Um, <coughs> what are the odds that it will change and our, our people can get more than 0.25? I'm going to just ask and, Jay and if he wants to speak more can. about it. What I know um, from my first experience in going through this last summer, Kate, is that we use the Consumer Price Index Urban Rate to calculate the base wage increase according to the schedule for our employees. And um, that's the rate that we begin with um, for negotiations. And um, Jay can speak to it too, but uh, I'm not sure if we go over that or what creates an exception to the rule. And I don't know if that's the true question. I will tell you that uh, in visiting with the association president and her conversations in a meeting at crew, they're actually telling people to expect zero. Right. Um, so this is a little bit above what uh, she tells me that they're expecting down there. And it is just a starting point for us. The board always has the authority to make decisions different than these, but We've talked about this in the past. It's the initial input variables, and you have to have a starting point. And uh, once we have a full set of input variables by the board, um, it's, the work's not done. It just allows us to then generate an output. What does that then result in as a budget? And then adjustments can start. Um, right. Uh, but this yeah, is a, it's a starting that. point. I think it's a realistic starting point based upon what I'm hearing from the crew really? office and seeing at the Department of Revenue website. Can you recall, Jay, what our starting point was last year? I mean, is this? 1.62. Right, that's what I mm -hmm. thought. So that's a huge difference. And I'm not blaming anyone who's putting this together. It's, it's a state, and I'm just speaking out as a, in a public forum because 
That's very disheartening, you know, as other expenses go up um, for our staff and to not see, and, and it's been a long time when you look at health insurance and everything else um, in a profession. <laughs> And, and to the board's credit, though, you've done many things. You, t you mentioned the health insurance kit, yeah. and we've done some um, progressive things to create opportunities where it wasn't coming in the salaries to try to deliver it in, in other ways. Um, but that I don't mean to detract at all from what you said. We you saw our utility rates going up 2%. Exactly. Everybody's utility rates are going to go up by 2%. Yeah, my thought was that, too. And that's I think that's something that not everyone understands is that costs that we simply cannot control <laughs> have to be paid for. We have to pay utilities. We have to do major improvements that have been on the list for a long time. And my um, point was, so do the employees. Their, their, their utility rates are going to go up 2%, but there's not yeah. a 2% increase. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I'm going to do a data request. Is it possible to learn and based on current employees? Um, if we did steps in lane, what that would amount to. And then, um, because in the past we've approached steps in lanes differently than the base wage increase. And so we've chosen to give steps and lanes or not give steps or lanes or give half a step or half, a, I guess half a step is what we've done in the past. And, and if the point two five isn't I guess doesn't feel good or doesn't feel right or isn't acceptable by the board. I just find it much more difficult for us to add later on and to go up from that 0.25 than to say we have a 3.8 and we reduce that somewhere along the line because you know that that's going to be spent. If it's only at 0.25 and say to do steps and lanes is, is a 3%, if we input for that 3%, we can always reduce from that. But if we have the 0.25 and then we go down the road of building a budget and say we only figured 0.25, but we want to give a point or 3.0, that will be much more difficult to do. So I guess I'm just asking for that figure, what that would be to do steps and lanes. And if you <coughs> share that with the board for future Consideration. I guess if I'm the only, am I the only one who wants to know that? Or I would love to know, know that. that. And if you'll accept some margin of error on that, Absolutely. no, yeah, because uh, <laughs> typically January is the time frame where we begin to take a close look at who's actually on staff at that time, what credits they have requested, and, uh, and do all that work. But if you'll let us cheat a little bit by just looking at historical patterns and kind of project based upon that, that shouldn't be too time consuming. I'm not Great, and I think helpful for us to have, so. Other questions? And I think you had said, Julie, that the increase or the savings by the changes that we're looking at for the insurance will probably be then those dollars will be spent and put back into those HSA in the first year that's why we have a zero percent so we anticipate uh, the um, bringing on board an HSA plan design will reduce premium but with that comes a new contribution from the employer to the employee in the form of HSA so as we get closer to really what that looks like in the adoption, that would be um, for next July 1st insurance. So we'd be looking at that in early spring. Um, Jay's already begun looking at that, of course. It's been in the plan uh, rollout for a few years now. Um, started with some HRA plan design. Um, so as we get closer to that, we'll know more about what that contrib contribution amount is. But that's why we've, we've used zero for the first year. And this isn't on the agenda. We'll still be looking at this for approval later. It's not part of the consent agenda. So I just wanted to make sure you all will keep working. So then the next item is budget level of funding commitment to rank order list. Yeah, so um, I, at the November 9th meeting, I brought to you the rank order list of our ununderfunded needs. And we um, consented that then. I'm at that point um, that this is our list of our needs. So 
then what I'm doing now is I'm coming to you and bringing um, a proposal as to um, with any revenue in excess of our expenditures that we have, what can we um, put towards this? And at this point in time, um, really our greatest need is a cash flow need. And there's a few different reasons for this. Um, one is we have a delay in cash due to categorical aid for this year. Um, usually we get that categorical aid in March, but we're not gonna see that till July of 2016. Um, and then also um, we delivered that there be a no tax increase, so we borrowed from our debt service fund. So there isn't that flexibility to just fulfill that when you need the cash, you can just grab it. So what I'm proposing is basically to keep it where the money is so we have that money um, to pay our bills when we need to pay our bills. <laughs> um, so kind of like long-term plan, you know, don't spend what you don't have kind of um, <laughs> process. So that's what I am um, bringing forward to for um, discussion, I guess, this evening. Okay. And the next item is also yours, and that, I think, is that the calendar? Yes, that is. Um, so, the, in creating the calendar for the upcoming 16-17 school year, um, brought, went to the employee relations team to get input, um, got quite a bit of input um, through our Google Docs, which was nice, because I think it's a little more easier to collect a lot of information that way. And then also collected, uh, got feedback from our leadership team. And from all the, the different input, um, developed the calendar you see before you, which actually has, um, in brief, 178 student contact days. Um, it has um, our, as far as our staff development days, it has our five days that we've had, <coughs> basically 191 contract days for teachers. So contract days for employees will stay the same. But um, this past year, the teachers right now have 180 student contact days. Um, reason being is we used to have to have under legislation 180 days of contact time. Um, and we had built in our three inclement weather days in that time. So if all of a sudden there wasn't any school, we still had that day and we're all good. Well, now it's based on minutes, not days. So um, what you'll notice is in our neighboring districts, they have 176 student contact days because of the length of their days. Um, but what I'm proposing is we still keep two inclement weather days built within our schedule, and we have our 178 student contact days, and we can meet our requirements of the DPI time. Um, the other feedback is they really wanted to have um, the, the time from when school starts to Thanksgiving break got very lengthy, and just to have a, a break in there in the time from our Christmas break until basically spring break, it got lengthy, and they're saying just one day of time would be very helpful. So what we did is we rearranged. So instead of having December 22nd off and extending the Christmas break, let's put a day in October, and instead of having um, April 13th and 14th, we took April 13th and said, let's put it in February on the 17th. And that also is the day of the um, convention that teachers could attend if they wanted to. So uh, that's pretty much the overview of the calendar. I don't know if any questions. Any questions? So will that provide a savings for us too with some of the, some of the areas where if we're only transporting 178 days, then we might have some savings that way. And Correct. You'll have savings with the in a couple different ways. One is the cost of the transportation of students for two more days. You won't have that, so it will be a few cost cost savings. Um, the other savings is when you have a a driver right now that maybe has a contracted for 180 days, they'll still have that 180 days. But we, what we wouldn't have to do, and this is what the logistics will be working out with the supervisors of these folks, is um, we might have paid someone to come in another day on top of their 180 days to come in and do some driving to practice and so on. That could be done within their contracted time then. So that could be some cost savings. So, yes. 
kind of in all areas like electricity and mm -hmm. those kind of things. We won't have the buildings open, but although we are we'll still utilizing we'll still have the buildings open because we'll have staff, mm -hmm. but um, not to the extent of the use. Yeah. So, any questions on that? Okay, and will that be on the next agenda? Yeah, that would be for, for the next meeting. Okay, so, so if questions. you want to take a look at that, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. So then that moves us on to item 10, consent agenda. I think there are seven items on the consent agenda this evening. Um, unless you want to have any items considered separately, I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda items as published. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Okay, a motion has been made and seconded to approve the consent agenda items as published. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Then moving on to board reports and discussion. I'll call on board members in the order of the call. <coughs> and if you want to share any committee reports or comments, please do. Mr. Dunlap. I never get to go. You are tonight. <laughs> I'd like to thank the LMC group for coming in and updating us. It, uh, I think it's really, very exciting and really cool to see it all finally coming together and being productive and see how excited they are. It's, it's, just, it's just great. Get the goosebumps. <laughs> and then I want everybody to have a very happy and safe Thanksgiving. That's all I have. Thank you. Um, Anita Jagosinski. Um, I wanted to thank the LMC group also and for letting us have the opportunity to use pseudonyms. I appreciated that. She who must be obeyed. My kids called me that, so thank you. <laughs> um, and I also just wanted to remind everybody to kind of keep an eye on everything that's going on at your state um, government level because there's a lot um, happening really quickly that affects public schools um, to a great degree. So. Please support your public schools. Please keep an eye on that. Please contact your legislators if you care about what's happening and if you would like public schools to be around for a long time, um, especially with the referendum legislation that's being proposed right now. Um, it's important, so keep your eyes open. Don't put your head in the sand. Um, stay informed, stay engaged. And that's all I have. Thank you. Um, Kate Mayer. I always like the the meeting where we get the report on all of the schools and I read all of those to see what we're doing and I'm just so amazed with that. It takes a long time to read but as I was thinking that to myself I'm like that must take a long time to put together as you gather all that information but I really do appreciate it. Um, ditto to, to Anita and Gary. Um, I did want to just kind of give some food for thought. I know that some boards of ed around the state are beginning to <coughs> present a letter about referenda. Um, and there was a the Madison clerk wrote a letter to in, in, for his school. Um, and then Stoughton, which, Very thank you, Anita. Yeah, um, and they were powerful letters. Um, I know that in speaking with, with our representatives, um, they're not going to vote for that. They really understand it, but they still want to be written to or called or emailed. But sometimes, I know in the past, we've presented a letter as a group, and there might be a lot of power in that. And I'm not sure if any of us know the exact date when that bill comes up for a vote. I know that it's passed on and getting ready for that, but it might be soon. So I don't know. That might be something we want to think about. Um, that's it. Okay. Collins. I also wanted to say thank you to the LMC group. It was great to see what you're doing, and um, my kids go to Prairie Review, so it's it's really neat to hear them talking about a lot of the different things with the library. And um, I would be in agreement with or support of doing a letter from our board. Um, again, I know our our legislators are supportive, but I think it sets a precedence for other boards across the state to see what we're willing to do, come together and kind of make a statement about that, our ability to have a referendum and have local control, and put on local control. So. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think we historically, and Jay and Anita, you probably remember, we did have a failed referendum, um, one, <coughs> that I've been on, and we did come back. I don't think it was 
at the next election, but I do think it was within shorter than two years, which oh, yeah. is what the requirement, I think, the new law is. And so in order to be able to respond to student needs, we had to come back um, sooner than the two years. So we might be able to put some historical data. It's not, because we usually hold our referendums on the regular election dates. So that's not the, the issue with us, because that really wouldn't change. But to take away that flexibility of making a decision locally on what is in the, you know, what's in the best interest. That's what they elect us to do, right. is yep. to make those decisions when they're taking it away. So maybe if we could get some research, look back at that when we had the one failed referendum, and that would be pretty easy, and then when did it, we go to referendum next? So um, other than that, I don't really have anything else to say. Happy Thanksgiving mm -hmm. to everyone. Um, keep your loved ones close. I think this week with some losses we've had um, recently, I think it's just a good reminder um, to do that. And having said that, I would just note that we have um, – You've got Finance Committee notes, Student Achievement and Learning Committee notes, and Buildings and Grounds. Um, I, there won't be a, a um, compensation model meeting next week because we are going to a conference to learn a little bit more about what other district has done and what other districts across the state, some of the best practices, best information. December 14th, uh, January 11th, we have board meetings coming up and the 20th to the 22nd of January is the convention. Um, so with that, anything else to come before the board? Seeing nothing, then I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? Is there a second? Second. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to stay for a Yeah, you just want to stay till eight, right? <laughs> All those in favor of adjourning, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. We are adjourned. <laughs>